And I'd like to invite on the stage our panel tonight, moderated by uh, Ms. Uh, Jennifer Hughes, uh, Asia editor of the Financial Times Lex column. Uh, joining her will be Ms. Mr. Hans Hogevorst, chair of the International Accounting Standards Board, uh, Mr. Carlson Tong, chair of the Hong Kong Securities and Futures Commission, uh, Mr. Clement Chan, uh, vice president of the Hong Kong Institute of Certified Public Accountants and also Vice Chair of the Asian Oceanian Standard Setters Group, uh, and also Mr. James Riley, uh, Group Finance Director of Jardine Matheson Holdings. So I'll hand over to uh, uh, Jen Hughes. Great, and my, I am mic'd up, wonderful. <coughs> um, hello everybody, and thank you very much for being here. And thank you for such an interesting speech after that was that laid out pretty much everything I was going to ask. But please, everybody, <laughs> but that's okay, it saved me doing the work, so thank <laughs> you. Um, please, everybody, feel free to ask questions, put your hand up. I think there are roving mics, but we're a room small enough that we should be able to hear. Um, you know, I'm not going to bother introducing everyone on the basis that between them they have way too many job titles, former and present. And I think they're all known to many of you, plus you have biographical details in front of you. Now, ever since I understood the basics of accounting, which wasn't too long ago, and I don't claim a deep understanding, I've been a little evangelical in terms of trying to get the Financial Times to cover more of this topic. <coughs> now, when I was the accounting correspondent, that was a fairly self-serving kind of thing I was doing. But ever since I joined the Lex column, I've still maintained that sort of interest. Because I think accounting is one of those things that everybody should try and understand a little bit more about, and I don't believe it needs to be rocket science. So it sounds like that much of the time. But one of the things I find most heartening is that whenever we do write about accounting in the next column, those notes are among the most read notes online, and they stay that way for days. We had one on goodwill accounting this <coughs> week. It's still in our top five. So there are people out there who are very interested in this topic, even if they don't always say so publicly. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, as I said, I won't bother introducing the panel, only need to say that between us we have auditors, regulators, financial directors, standard setters, and politicians, past and present. I think that covers most job titles, so probably not all of Clement's current roles. <laughs> right. Look, I said, I mean, the main thing we're talking about is strengthening financial reporting. That's sort of the underlying theme of everything. Um, you know, David Tweedy, Hans' predecessor, once described it as keeping capitalism honest. That's what he thought the role of accounting was, which I thought was a pretty neat description. So to start with a really basic question to see where we all sit on this, I'll ask each of you, who are accounts for? Now, we heard here that there are the accounts are for regulators as input from Basel on what the accounts should contain. Accounts are meant to be for investors. Are they just about making decision usefulness, or decision usefulness, that's what the Americans call it, or is it stewardship, which is the old UK definition? So I'd just like to ask each of you in turn who you think the main constituent is, and can they all sit in one set of accounts? Uh, well, I, I guess I'm the first one to start. Then, well, having the... Uh, luxury of, uh, of uh, including a lot of uh, people that the other mentioned in his uh, speech. I think uh, the accounts actually are for a lot of stakeholders, to start with investors, uh, regulators, bankers, creditors, debtors, you know, who, who are all doing business with uh, the reporting entity. So, uh, you know, in a nutshell, uh, the financial statements, you know, the information conveyed by the financial statements could be useful to a lot of people, depending on the position, depending on the angle that they are looking at the uh, financial statements. Mm -hmm. Hans? Our, we write our standards for everybody who entrusts their money to somebody else. And that is just about everybody. It's indeed investors, it's creditors, it's depositors, and thereby also for the protectors of the depositors, the regulators. Um, our market economy cannot function without trust, and we are in the business of providing trust to the market as a whole. So I don't like this question, who is our primary uh, audience? Uh, it, is, it is society at large. I, I suppose accounts, I mean, comes from what must be accountability. 
So really, you are accounting for your activities over a certain past period. Um, so I agree with uh, uh, what Clement and Hans said. Obviously, it's for all the stakeholders. <clears throat> but having said that, though, is accounts are so complicated now. If you're saying, oh, we want our investors to understand accounts, I, I really challenge anybody to say that uh, investors can understand accounts. I've been an accountant for 37 years. And now I, I'm a bit confused as to where I should look for <laughs> which page to turn to. So, so really, I, I think we probably have to ask ourselves what are accounts for. Clearly, there is a benefit that is served, but who are the target audience? And I think to think that everybody in the street would read accounts, maybe we have gone beyond that. Okay. Uh, has that, has that ever been the case? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> but, but, but they need to be intelligible. And I think it seems to me that there's a whole series of stakeholders mentioned. In, in many ways, I look at accounts as they're for the preparer, in the sense they are the principal um, medium by which companies, corporates, institutions actually present um, what they're doing and uh, the financials to, to the world at large. And so whilst they aren't technically a stakeholder, it's actually they that have the most to win or lose um, according to how well effectively they're put together and regulated. So I would also add uh, the preparers as being an important element of who the accounts are for. So it, accounts are for everyone. It, it is true. Uh, it, it, it does give preparers also a lot more insight in their own business. Uh, when we bought, brought pension liabilities on the balance sheet, uh, for the first time many preparers realized how deep the problems were that they had with pensions. So it is also not just for the outside investor, but also for the preparer himself. I, I would challenge that. I, I'm being very provocative tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think preparers prepare the accounts for the stakeholders. Of course. Yeah. If you see what I mean. Uh, they do, but they, 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 they're they a very important tool yes, for the yes. preparer. And because it's, thing, it's, all about, tool. it's all about uh, 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 your, your valuation, your market assessment, your performance. Therefore, preparers are all driven. The mindset is to, I want to prepare some account for their stakeholders to look at. And, and so obviously it puts them in a, th there's a potential direct conflict. In, in I'm not saying, but I, I'm just challenging it, that it, it is interesting. So the, the, the preparers are looking at accounts from a very different point of view from investors and regulators and the markets. Oh, that, and that's why they should not have the final say in how may we make our standards. I totally agree. <laughs> 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 sorry. sorry. <laughs> no, no, don't apologize. We like conflict. Keep it going. It's great. Um, I would obviously say that as far as I'm concerned, accounts are for journalists to read. So if you make them simpler, that would make my life better too. Um, we we're talking also about the importance of a single set of global standards. Now, Hans, I will come on to your relationship with the US and how well that's going in a minute. But before that, can we, can we ever really get a single set of global accounting standards? You know, I, I write about companies across Asia and even ones using IFRS, I sometimes have to think about how they're applying it and what they're doing if I'm looking for true comparability. I know we're talking about maybe <coughs> a different dialect and a different language, but that's not a single set to me. First of all, you know, these communiques of the G20, they contained a slight mistake. They always talk about a single set of global standards. What we, of course, really need is a single set of global standard setters. <laughs> and then we would have those, <coughs> and then we would have that global set uh, auto automatically. Um, it is true that uh, having a single set of global standards in itself is not a guarantee for uh, even application around the world. But one thing is for sure, if you have 35 different languages around the world, you will never have the beginning of comparability. So first you need a global set of uh, standards, and then at the same time, of course, you have to work to improve e even application around the world. It's being done in Europe at this moment. Uh, Europe before had 20 different accounting languages. There was absolutely no way for investors to compare notes. Uh, now ESMA is working very hard on the basis of that single set of standards in the European Union to improve application. Yesterday they produced a very important report on uh, the impairment of goodwill, which is 
unevenly being applied. Uh, you, you can really wonder in that in the current circumstances why companies still have so much goodwill on their books. Uh, this work can only be done because the European Union has adopted IFRS. If, if you do not begin with that, forget it. We're talking about a European Union that has adopted the IFRS with a carve out where it didn't like it. A small carve out. <laughs> <laughs> it's absolutely Still not a single. Now, out of 8,000 companies in, in the, the European Union, only 20 use the carve outs, and everybody knows who they are. They would be so. 20 large banks. Financial institutions are, you know. Yeah, and the banks are always a problem. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'd all agree with that. <coughs> I think the regulators should tell them, uh, listen, no more carve-outs. <laughs> to me, I think it's a journey. It's, it's all relative. If you look at it uh, <coughs> 10 years ago, look at the uh, accounting standards and framework that there was you know, around the globe. And look at today, OK, US is not on board yet, and uh, Japan is coming on. But uh, it's all relative. You know, look at uh, most of uh, our region, Asia, Oceanic region. Uh, look at Europe. Uh, nowadays, you know, when you talk about MNCs, when, the, when you look at the financial statements, uh, actually you can see a lot of uh, comparability there as compared with the past. We're not there yet, but I think we're getting there. Right, right direction. Carlton? I think that's a key point. We've come an extraordinarily long way. I mean, we had adopted IFRS in 1992, and at that point I don't think there was a single country that had effectively brought itself into line with international standards. If we look at where we've got to today, it's an extraordinary uh, progress in 20 years. It's probably going to be longer than we would like before all of the major um, countries in the world do come into line or adopt IFRS. But even now, it's a massive amount of progress because if we look back to when every single country had a different set of standards and very different approaches to how accounting was adopted, um, it was impossible at that point to have truly international markets. Today, it's possible but you still need to be quite bright and um, knowledgeable to pull the various elements together. Yeah. But it's a lot simpler than it was. Yes, I, I don't think you should give the accounting standard setters such a hard time. Because if you compare to global regulatory reform, that we, we are even more further apart uh, than accounting standard setters. <laughs> I, I, I suppose it, it is national interest versus global interests, uh, And the world is mm -hmm. moving. Yeah. Uh, but what perhaps we, we forget is that the, the, the market's becoming more global. And that's the difference between the past. So really, time is pushing us towards more globalization. Uh, and we need the convergence process. I know it's tough, uh, but to, to move faster. Because one does compare and, and accomplish lists cross-border. I mean, overseas companies list in Hong Kong. and and you want to compare. And, and if they're based on different accounting standards, it makes it very difficult for, for investors, for the analysts <coughs> uh, to make any sense of it. So if we're getting towards a potato potato situation, which we're getting somewhere. I can see that. Now, talking about different pronunciations of the English language, Hans, what happens next to the ISB and how does it engage with people around the world now we're ending what we might call the Norwalk period. Yeah, well, this year uh, will be a year of big change uh, for the ISB. <coughs> we are going to finish up the main uh, convergence projects with the uh, uh, FESB, hopefully. Um, impairment, hopefully. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, most of the work will be done, and some of the work is truly excellent, such as revenue recognition, uh, leases, uh, greatly increasing uh, comparability around, uh, around the world. I still hope that we will get a solution for impairment as well. And then, you know, that period comes to an end and we have already started working on our new agenda. And one thing is for sure that in the future, our, the, the whole idea of convergence was to pave the way for US adoption. Well, we'll have to wait and see what's going to happen, but we cannot have this bilateral relationship with the FESB dominate our work again. We are, we are now a full-grown, uh, mature organization with over 100 countries around the world using our uh, standards. They have to come first. Uh, and we have to work closely with our constituents. So we're going to replace this bilateral relationship with a multilateral uh, relationship with uh, our constituents around the world. We're going to set up 
an advisory body consisting of national standard setters and regional bodies, as such as the AOSSG, the uh, um, uh, Asia Oceana uh, Standard Setters uh, Group. Uh, and we're going to work very closely with them uh, to get extra input at an early, uh, at an early time from, from the regions, from the, uh, the, the, the jurisdictions in the development of our new standards. Uh, to know that we are on the right track uh, or not, uh, and to also ease the, um, create a climate in which endorsement of our um, uh, standards uh, will become easier than it uh, might have been without this uh, multilateral framework that we are creating. On the, the US issue, do you think the US will ever accept IFRS. Now I say this, on the, my, I don't believe they will accept international standards unless they look like American ones. It's a long held view of mine. Yeah. I'd like to know what you think. Well, you know, I've, I'm a, a former politician, so I'm still inclined to believe what politicians say. <laughs> 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 and as long as the G20 says we are striving for a single set of global standards, that's what I choose to believe. And, and the United States is a member of the G20, and a prominent member of the G20, and they, every year they promise that. So undoubtedly it will happen. That was a very diplomatic answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> nicely done there, Hans. Yeah. Um, James, Carson, do you think, does it matter if the US doesn't join? Can we live with two different languages? I, I think we can, but it would be much better if they did. I think, though, it's only much better in my mind. I'm prejudiced. I come from one side of the debate, I suppose, if it's on the right terms. And I do think the fundamentals of maintaining a, a, the true and fair concept and of using a principles-based approach is absolutely crucial. And, and I worry that we have, in the process of convergence, been drawn too far uh, towards a... Um, a comply with requirements approach of ticking 10,000 boxes uh, as evidenced by the, I forget what it is, 1,500 pages of standards now or so that it's become uh, so prescriptive. Well, it's more, sorry, I'm out of touch, but <laughs> it's become so lengthy and complex that we've, we have drip, we're still principles based, but the drift has been too much uh, to be very prescriptive and not allowing enough in the way of judgment. And I do worry that to reach a settlement with, with uh, the United States would require a move to that ticking 10,000 boxes. We, we, we have uh, three and a half thousand pages of principles, uh, but that is a lot better than the 17,000 pages, yes. pages of US GAAP. <laughs> and uh, I think you are very correct in warning us to not stray too far from our principle-based approach because I am convinced it's absolutely the best way to go. I, I think sometimes you can become too purist in this. At the end of the day, it's all about comparability. Um, if you try your best and you agree to disagree, as long as you can highlight the differences, then for the investors, that should be good enough. I mean, it's not perfect, but, but it, it, it would at least, it, it's agreeing what you disagree. I think perhaps that's, that's the key. And so that people understand what are the principles apply under US standards, and IFRS, and the reason why it's different is because of, then it's up to investor and analysts to decide for themselves how they choose to judge it. But I mentioned catching you the, all these pages. I used to remember all the counting standards, but before this um, panel session, remember, I, <laughs> I, I mentioned to Jai, I said, do not embarrass me by mentioning IFRS 9, because I have no idea what they stand for, <laughs> and I didn't trust you. So before I came, I, I took a copy of the, <laughs> <laughs> the accounting standards book, and I photocopy, you know, it's all these accounting standards. So we've got IFRS, we've got IAS, we've got IFRIC, and, and yeah. it is really getting so a little it, bit... What's the problem? <laughs> 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 is it, these are all uh, very high quality standards. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, so, Carlson, do you want to test hands and see how many of them he knows? Uh, um, no, no, I don't think I'll do that. <laughs> you promise not to prove embarrassment. No, no, I, I won't do that. <laughs> I think given, given, given the, uh, the choice, of course, you know, convergence is, uh, is, a, is a good outcome. 
But I think the challenge is uh, when you look at, you know, sort of corporates uh, or entities uh, operating in the same industries, <coughs> say, you know, I pick uh, banks, you know, financial institutions, and if their sort of underlying accounting uh, assumptions and, and, and rationale is different, I think it's quite challenging for uh, the analysts to, uh, to try to compare the performance like a US-based bank and European-based bank, particularly with uh, well-regulated like, like a Basel, Basel III. It's, it's, it's going to be a mess you know, for, for, for that kind of area. Now, one thing you know, James mentioned there was about the fact that with convergence there been too much drift towards box tick and we want to get back to principal standards. My suspicion is it's not just, it wasn't just an American drift that way. It was a drift by a lot of the, the stakeholders in accounting standards, the auditors, for example, and yes, we have auditors up here, past and present, who say, well, look, what do you mean by this? How should we interpret this? And people are always asking for more guidance. Do we need to change the mindset of those who have to apply the standards as well as the people who write them? I, I think so, but we also have to help a little bit uh, there. But it is true that uh, both auditors and regulators, they tend to be risk aver averse. And we, when we have disclosure uh, requirements, um, they often feel it's better sa to be safe than to be sorry. So they include pages and pages of uh, disclosures which might not be all that relevant or uh, material, just to be sure that they don't get the regulator on their back. So we are engaging with auditors to see what can we do to help you use your judgment more than is the case currently. Because it can be done. I mean, I have read financial statements of complex multinational companies uh, with activities around the world which do not have excessive notes, which do have a clear story uh, to tell. And they use our standards. So it is not necessary to drown in sorrow of in the sorrow of disclosures. Um, so yes, there can be a different attitude. Uh, we have to do our part. I think in the conceptual framework that we're going to finish up in the next couple of years, we should give clearer guidance on what principles to use uh, as to the, um, uh, the, the use of disclosures, when, to, uh, when are they relevant and when, when are, uh, when are uh, they not. For example, for a is it for Deutsche Bank or another big bank? Is it relevant to disclose the uh, depreciation, reconciliation of their furniture? I don't think so. Uh, so um, yes, there, we need a bit of a mentality change, but we have to help along the way. Well, I could say as a journalist, I don't think I've ever met a piece of information I didn't want to have. So I'm probably one of the people who would actually push for more disclosure and more footnotes. I don't mind stuff being the footnotes. I just want to be able to find it in the PDF version of the accounts. And so I might be going against the grain here. Mm. My, my suspicion is instead that I don't think the, prep, the preparers of accounts make things clear enough. And I think some companies deliberately try not to make things clear. Perhaps I've just spent too many nights going through I th And account. I think there are, there, are, there are both categories. I mean, the, I think preparers do need to make more effort to make their accounts intelligible and understandable rather than themselves simply feeling they're bound by regulations and have to disclose reams of information. They have to disclose it, but how they disclose it, how they talk about it and present it uh, is very important. The one thing that uh, I am convinced by is that what the um, ISB has got right is allowing a certain degree of flexibility in terms of the headline presentation and not being absolutely rigorous in saying you can only talk about this number and no other number, uh, and whether intentionally or not, in a sense, it's allowed a greater degree of discretion. And those that, I think, take trouble over it can present their numbers intelligibly whilst having the 400 pages at the back of the accounts that, I mean, people have always worried about chopping down trees. Increasingly, it'll be electronic, so it's a less of an issue of that information also available. But it's, it's how the front and the is presented and structured that's so important. And it is the auditors and the regulators, but it is also the preparers yes. putting the effort in. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Carlson, that was one thing you brought up when I was terrifying you with IFRS 9 and other issues is, you know, you talked about, I think your phrase was old fogies, who wanted simpler accounts and thought that you, you, you were saying that you thought the income statement had got too complicated that people can't use it. 
Yes, when, when, when I started practicing accounts, uh, I understood what a profit figure meant. If a company say I make a profit is X pounds or Hong Kong dollars, I knew what that meant. I meant that uh, I know they meant that comparing to cost, you make a profit or you make a loss, and you provide for losses but you don't take profits until they realize. Very simple. But now it's not so simple. So when someone say, oh, my profit is an X figure, I would say, what do you mean? What does that include? Does it include property revaluation? Does it include uh, 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 various financial instruments? What is it? I have to ask a hundred different questions to understand what does that profit figure but or loss figure mean. That's why, Carlson, I think it's so important for the preparers to take an element in their hand because there is a bottom line profit figure that is consistent across all corporates. But actually, in the way one prepares, one can actually be establishing a standard for how one does it as a corporate, highlighting which items one is separating out as outside the way management look at profit. Uh, and but which figure is that? Because if you look at the newspaper financial earnings per share, earnings per share is profit after tax and after everything. So if, if you're an investor, you look at what's the P-E ratio is 18 times. That is based on the net profit after tax, after everything. So the, the market out there, don't look at it like that, if the you see what I mean. It does look at it like that. I can assure you that if actually a company takes the trouble to present its numbers, the market will actually stop looking at the um, uh, IFRS profit number mm. ultimately if one spends consistently enough and rigidly enough or, or rigorously enough mm. affirming a different number and gets the market's confidence of that number. But then it's up to the preparers who produce quality information. Yeah. It would be nice if accounting standards actually separate. Yeah, but Carson, I think two things that ha have happened that have made things more complex. Mm. First of all, business has become much more complex. Even small and medium-sized companies these days use derivatives. If you have derivatives, you have fair value accounting, it becomes really difficult. Mm -hmm. Secondly, in the past, things were deceivingly simple because a lot of stuff was just left off the balance sheet, mm -hmm. such as derivatives were used to be at cost. They start with the cost of zero. They were not accounted for until uh, we uh, were hit with a lot of uh, scandals. Pensions. Uh, which are very complex accounting, mm. because it's really complex bi uh, uh, business, it was off balance sheet. And yes, we have required to put it on the balance sheet because it provides better information to the investor. Yes, it is more complex, but life is complex. The reality is complex. If you want to make life more simple, don't do this. But obviously, uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> don't, don't use derivatives, don't, don't give pensions, but obviously, <laughs> but, but obviously both are very uh, useful things to do. And it comes down to me in a presentational sense. I mean, we always have the debate internally that you can have a terribly complex subject or issue and someone can produce an extraordinarily uh, erudite note at great length on the subject. Mm. But lots of people can do that. The real art is someone who can produce in two sides of paper a summary of all the issues yes. associated with and an issue can be and wrong. make it intelligible. And that's the art, in my view, of accounts as well, of being able to take something that's highly complex, all the information being there at the back, but being able to pull out. But the, do the accounts one read now serve their purpose? Maybe not all of them. That, and that's the challenge of a whole series of the stakeholders, but I mean, particularly the preparers. One, one thing that I, I, I think is important is a conceptual framework. To understand what does profit mean, what does revenue mean. At present, it, it is standard adding to standards. And, and it is very confusing for sort of, uh, it's confirming yeah. the old accountants like me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. So I would agree that it is confusing, but I also think that market can get quite comfortable with things. I remember when you know, you know, um, banks and the fair valuing of their own debt, when if their credit worthiness falls, they actually record a paper profit going through P&L. Uh, this still goes on. But everyone has got to understand this over time. And most reports I see um, in the newspapers will strip that straight out of a bank's accounts before they even get there. So people do understand things over time, and I think we can take different profit numbers. It's going to be up to preparers, is it not, as you say, James, to make sure it's done responsibly. Yeah, but, uh, but that is present. going to be one of the major challenges of our yes. conceptual framework yeah. um, uh, work, which is um, how to define income. Uh, I'm pretty sure we will not come up with one definition. <laughs> we, will keep earnings, we will keep earnings as they are, but we will 
probably subdivide OCI into the less meaningful stuff and the more meaningful stuff. OCI does contain technical plugs, but it also contains very meaningful information, such as, for example, the changes in the long-term pension liabilities, which, which companies don't want to interfere with their earnings but are still very important information about the financial performance of a, of a company. So if we can get that done mm. some way or another, I think um, we'll have done a good job, but it's uh, too early to tell. Mm. I like your optimism. Ellen, you're taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think one of the other things, it's, it's very valuable, the ISB has done well, but there's this constant fit, pitfall. As new standards come in, there's always danger that a well-intentioned standard can in one way or another create an absurd outcome in some respects. And there, the degree to which um, the standard setters have been proactive in then addressing those issues when they come up, because they're never going to be able to pick up every point first time and try and rectify those, such as, I think, I mean, there still needs to be a rectification if, if it can be found for the position on banks where the less their credit worthiness, uh, the less the liability they have to recognize. It, it, but, but has, working been, the it has been fixed, and for the endorsers of the, Hong Kong is an endorser of IPRS 9, if I'm not yes. mistaken. Yes. So you have fixed it for yourself. Europe can fix it by endorsing <laughs> IPRS 9. <laughs> we still make <laughs> and it, but it's fixing those sort of problems and being yeah. proactive in doing that. Yeah. That's what makes the standards, I think, get, get better. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I have a question for Hans. Is I'm not supposed to ask a question here, but no, no, can I ask a question? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, who is responsible for the application of standards? Because it's, that's very important at the end of the day. Yeah. Is Primar have you applied in the country or, or? Primarily the preparer. the preparer. Secondarily, the auditor. And thirdly, the regulator. Right. And hopefully also the investor by keeping a close eye on what's going on. Yeah, but ISB did issue a letter during the global financial crisis. Oh, yes. When, when you weren't yes. happy with... Uh, <laughs> yes, but what, what, uh, th this, was when, uh, this was when the, 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 there was uneven application of the write-off of Greek debt in 2011. We got a lot of information from the market and also just reading the Financial Times that that was going all over the place. Some countries were writing off 22%, others were uh, writing off the fair value, which was 80%, which is exactly what it turned out to be in the end. And so... We felt that the integrity of our work was being damaged. And what do you do when you see something fishy going on? You call the police, and that's what we did. We wrote a letter to ESMA, the, uh, the European uh, group of, uh, of regulators. We told them, listen, we think something fishy is going on. Please do something about it. Mm -hmm. We didn't do it ourselves. We just mm -hmm. alerted the regulator, and it was fixed within six months. So would the ISB have a process of watching how accounting standards are being applied? No, this is not something that we plan to do every year or every month. Uh, but if, if something really obvious and, and uh, really uh, damaging is going on, why could we not do the same as any right. citizen could do? Yeah. As a regulator, I'm interested in what you said. So. <laughs> Sorry, I won't say any more. No, no, keep going. It's great. I've got to say, as a journalist, I was very interested in that letter, so thank you, Hans. The FT got to see it as well. It's a good story for us. And I believe it was the French banks that were doing the 22%. Uh, not, not, don't always single out the French. I have a French chairman. <laughs> <laughs> and he's a really good guy. <laughs> but, but uh, uh, no, it was, not just, it was not just French banks. All right. I will stop. Well, what was very interesting, though, that in in France it was no. Don't say it. <laughs> I rest my case. <laughs> yeah. right. Now, I did want to ask about a couple of the big standards issues, and this is going to be a test for Hans and perhaps Clement as well to explain in words of one syllable what is going on with the impairment situation, and also lease accounting because they're hot topics. They're going to come up. It's helpful to get a summary. OK. The impairment. We had a joint solution with uh, the FASB. Uh, FASB decided that they were going to have second thoughts, more like third or fourth th th thoughts, or because we have been working uh, on this for, for years. I think it's very embarrassing, to tell you the truth, uh, also looking at the regulator there. And they have done Basel III in a couple of years, and we are still working on impair impairment. It's really 
the only defense that I have is that you don't have two Basel co committees and we have two standard setters and that, that is what makes it very difficult. What is, what is, the, what is, the, what is the, the, the big difference between uh, the FESB model and uh, our um, uh, model? Uh, whereas we also think that for all assets from the beginning you have to make a provision as a sort of a yield adjustment for the credit risk that you uh, in, in, incur. We think that you should only take a lifetime expected loss after a signif significant deterioration of the asset. That's what we uh, uh, propose. The FESB has proposed that you take the full lifetime expected loss at inception of the loan, at the day one, which pushes the value of the loan below, way below its uh, book value, way be below its fair value at the point uh, at the point that point in time. Our problem with that approach is that, first of all, it doesn't give a fair presentation of the truth because. The truth is not that when you give somebody a loan of 100,000 uh, euros or dollars that from day one it's only worth 90,000 uh, yeah. dollars. And secondly, that it can gi give uh, uh, very wrong uh, economic uh, incentives. For example, German bank. For a German bank it's very normal to give 30-year mortgages. That means that for th that type of loan you have quite big expected lifetime losses because the lifetime is very long. So if you take ex expected lifetime losses on day one, uh, you have to take a hit on, uh, on day one. Suppose you're in time of crisis and your earnings as a bank are already under pressure. Are you still going to give that type of loans uh, that you know will depress your earnings? The easiest way to restore, restore your earnings is not give, to not give out loans. Okay. So that's our problem with that approach. Uh, let's hope that uh, both uh, proposals are going to be tested in the market in the next couple of months. Uh, let's hope that uh, uh, constituents around the world will give us clear signals as to what they think is the best solution. Uh, we are always open to change our mind if, uh, if, if, if people tell us that the ideas that we have are not good enough. Um, uh, and hopefully the same is the, c the, the case uh, with the FESB. So let's see where uh, this ends. So we've gone round about one, two, uh, three or four times now on this one, and now we've got the divergence. Yeah, it's, it's, it's terrible. We've every got the drafts coming out soon, right? Yeah. Next couple of months. Yes. Right. The thing is, every time that we do create a standard that, that makes a lot of economic sense, banks t tell us they cannot do it. <laughs> and, Not and, just French And then they ask us banks. to do something that uh, they, what they want to do often doesn't make economic sense. But <laughs> Mr. Yen can tell you all about that. <laughs> 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 we'll be interested in your response when the exposure draft comes out. <laughs> I mean, I think we're all okay on moving from an in sort of the, ex the incurred loss model to inspected loss that was proved otherwise in the crisis. My fear is still that you're going to end up with some form of cookie jar provisioning where you just got this big black hole which funds go into in the good times and just come out in the bad times. Well, that's why we think that you should only take the full impairment when there is indeed a significant deterioration, when something economic has happened. That's a, a, another problem of the FESB uh, approach. If you take the full hit at the beginning, you do in create in indeed create a sort of a cookie jar. And the temptation will be very big to release those provisions in, uh, the, the in, 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 in times that are not so good, which might make uh, a lot of sense in, ter in prudential terms, but it gives a misleading presentation of the actual performance of the bank. It seems that things are still hunky-dory, uh, whereas the, the performance is really deteriorating. Uh, and we feel that the profit, and loss, profit or loss should really indicate what is going on uh, and should not give a misleading uh, uh, information. Clement, do you have any thoughts on this one? Uh, I think uh, Hans actually uh, summarizes very well from, uh, from the uh, incurred loss to the expected loss. I think the challenge is, is uh, uh, if, you, if, you, if you push the uh, point of, uh, of uh, judgment and realization to, to the outlook from the, uh, from the outset, then uh, definitely you know, it, will, it will set a lot of things into light that uh, whether you should you know, sort of uh, go on to giving out that loan or not. One of the things that always comes up 
when you're trying to change standards like this and you're trying to introduce complexity, as those who don't like it say, it's also the expense of producing accounts. Now, James, I'd be interested in your th thoughts on this. Is that really a valid excuse? Because I, I'm skeptical. I think there's a bunch of banks who don't want to have to put their loans out on a show like this. But then I'm a journalist, so I'm skeptical of most companies. I start from that point of view. Sorry, everyone, but I do. Well, I think, first of all, obviously, it's much broader than banks. Um, but uh, I mean, I think it's not an excuse. Um, but I do think at the same time, there is uh, important to allow concepts of materiality to come to play and the, the degree to which disclosure is required according to that materiality. There is a danger, I think, to be having to produce rafts of information in areas that are really not that material or relevant to the specific nature of the company concerned. And again, elements of judgment are important to come into play to ensure that what is being produced is relevant, is material to, to readers, not just out of intellectual curiosity. There's always going to be someone who's preparing a table of a thousand companies and wants to be able to put in a figure for every single one of those companies. But in my <laughs> mind, that isn't... My uh, and uh, <laughs> I was looking at you, yes. <laughs> um, there was, there, but, but the reality is uh, you know, that isn't always justified because if actually the nature of a complex 10 or 12 page piece of disclosure is actually a whole series of numbers that are a single digit, um, actually, the work that goes into preparing it should be by a combination of the auditors and the preparers and the way the standard uh, words what's required enable them to be some discretion in that respect. But beyond that, for material information, ensuring that there is full and adequate disclosure is critical. And the fact that it costs money is beside the point. That's part of the cost of running the company. What I can say is someone who now writes for the Lex column and those notes are 330 words long, trying to explain an accounting issue and get to a conclusion that makes any sort of sense in there is virtually impossible. So I do have some sympathy. I'm not entirely suspicious of how things go. Now, one thing I wanted to move on to was, um, picking up on Arthur's points earlier, the role of auditors and regulators in ensuring financial standards. And I think between you would have some very interesting views on that. You know, what should, well, Carson, let's start with you. What should regulators be doing to really ensure that financial standards are the strongest they can be and are implemented properly? I, I don't think it should be the job of the regulators to judge whether a set of accounts, if we say there's been audited in accordance with accounting standard, to say, oh, no, maybe they haven't. It's not for us to second guess. It is up to the regulatory body responsible for regulating the auditing profession to do their work, to do their due diligence, to do their practice review, and give us assurance. I think that, I mean, it's a regulator. How can I have to go in to, to pull the accounts apart because I, I'm not sure whether the profit figure they sign off is what it's meant to be. So I will look to the regulation of the auditing profession to say, is that is that regulation, is that framework one that I can trust? If it's one I can trust, then I can say I can rely on it because when I set, receive a set of accounts audited by HKICP or auditor firm, I know that it will have complied with all the auditing standards under the framework. So I, I look at the, who is the regulator of the auditing profession. Hans is a former regulator and now an accounting standard setter. Where would you, do, would you see more role for the regulators, for financial regulators, in ensuring this? Well, absolutely. They have a, uh, the securities regulators have an en enormously uh, important uh, part to play. I believe that it's, for us it's extremely important to have very intensive communication uh, with both the securities regulators and the prudential regulators. I think uh, one of the main tragedies in the period preceding the crisis was that the prudential regulation and the accounting standards grew too far apart, that uh, the, the Basel ratios were too far removed from the economic reality as presented in our financial statements. They are growing together. I don't think close enough yet, but uh, at least in Basel III, you now have a leverage ratio. Uh, which is simply based on our uh, numbers. And some people say, such as uh, Andy Haldane from the Bank of England and uh, Thomas Hernick from uh, the FDIC, they say, let's forget about all this difficult risk weighting uh, and uh, complicated stuff. 
uh, let's just take a, a simple and higher uh, leverage ratio and it will make the whole system a lot, uh, a lot simpler and, 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 and safer. Um, so I'm, I'm very happy with that uh, development. Um, people always say that, often say that there is a conflict of interest between regulators, uh, especially the prudential regulators and the counting standards, etc. I do not believe that that is the case. Um, yes, prudential regulators have to work at stability. We work at transparency, but you cannot have stability without transparency. And that is why we ultimately work for the same goal. Now, I wanted to ask also about the audit opinion in financial statements, because this is one that comes up whenever anything goes wrong with the company. Where were the auditors? And then they start going on about the audit opinion. Now, there was a senior accountant in the UK, um, former head of KPMG here at John Griffiths Jones, I'm sure you know him, Carlson, and he suggested the audit opinion could be one line long. It could literally say, these accounts looked good to us, full stop, love KPMG. <laughs> At the same time, I mean, <laughs> you could have a whole page for it, it would look great. Um, at the other time, we get people asking for more and more information and for auditors to give out more information in the audit opinion. So, I mean, Clement, maybe starting with you, is that possible to give out more information? Would you like to give more information? I mean, I'd certainly like to see it. Million dollar question. Actually, uh, from, from an auditor point of view, I think uh, when you talk about regulators, um, the international auditing, you know, IA, IAASP, they come up with, uh, you know, a set of uh, standard auditing standards. And standard auditing standards include, you know, uh, uh, auditing standards of in particular in, 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 in response to a certain particular situation, as well as the quality control of a firm, ISQC. And uh, for auditors, if you follow those rules uh, rigidly and diligently, you are supposed to have a very well robust set up, you know, sort of internal control system, whereby you can you can do your work, you know, uh, uh, on 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 uh, properly, and 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 you know, sort of uh, all those things that uh, that are contained in the financial statements irregularities. You got a good chance to uncover it, but it's not a guarantee, because of all those um, things like uh, if you're talking about uh, 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 fraud and uh, management collusion, all those things. And, and then yeah, it's very, very difficult for auditors to, 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 to uncover those in a normal audit, pro or in normal audit engagement, apart from, uh, 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 we're not talking about investigation engagement, yeah. which is totally different. So on that note, uh, as being an auditor, whether I would like to have a very simple audit opinion saying that uh, based on the work that we've done, we could give a, a, a true and fair opinion. Yes, I would love to do so. Uh, however, doing that, I think uh, the, the growing challenge is uh, the, the, the different angle that uh, regulators are, are looking at auditors and uh, in, in different parts of the world and uh, in different sort of uh, 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 cases where irregularities come to light. I think uh, uh, some, some of the uh, regulators, uh, they might not be looking at it from, from, the, um, from the reasonable angle. <laughs> Unreasonable regulators? I can't believe we'd ever see that. Uh, I, I, I think it's, it's definitely sometimes gaps are there. It's how to bridge the gap by openly discussing about that, by openly communicating about that, I think that's one way to bridge it. I think it's very important that it's kept simple what the auditors are expected to do, and that would be reflected in a very simple audit statement. So there are simple elements in terms of prepared in accordance with accounting standards or whatever the local, but fundamentally is a statement that the uh, accounts present a true and fair view, and whatever the precise words that are used for that, those are the key words one's looking for, uh, there's a lot of other verbiage that's needed within the way it's structured, but I very much would be sympathetic to the, um, the line of argument from the KPMG senior partner. And I think any idea that one would have um, auditors somehow constructively contributing to uh, some form of discussion and analysis of the performance of the company um, would very quickly become highly structured and artificial because the whole focus from an audit point of view would simply be protect their position 
uh, and really that's not what, in my mind, their job is to do at all, and it's unwise to be asking them to do it. So what, if people are asking for more information on this, I guess, because auditors will never talk about clients, and believe me, I spent two years trying to get them to do it, and it never happened. Um, I guess it's more engagement from the company then to answer the questions people might have about the process or something. Absolutely. That's fine by me. More engagement by companies is always welcome. Carlson. Yeah, I mean, it, it is not the auditor's job. I mean, if the auditors do not agree with the accounts, then they say so. They qualify audit report. Otherwise, they say it's a clear no other opinion. I, I, I think I, I agree with John Griffiths Jones. These accounts are okay in accordance with auditing <laughs> standards. It's all I need. If I want to see how they've done the audit, I go and look at auditing standards. I don't need, how, how, how many pages do you want the audit report to be? So I think it's either yes, it passed the test, or it doesn't, then what are the issues? All, all, all these reams of no, serve no purpose. And for, as a regulator, I'm only interested in whether the auditor has done their job in accordance with auditing standards. If they haven't, they're in trouble. Well, actually, <laughs> and there's only one point I would add, Carlson, is I do think there's that element, but I do think it's even more important that they're able to say they give a true and fair view. Yes, yes, And yes. it's not absolutely clear that those two go together. I mean, in my mind, the US approach is that basically the account's been prepared in accordance with a thousand regulations tick. But actually, a key point is the auditors to look at the accounts and say, these give a true and fair view. And that's where presentation complexity is a factor because it's possible sometimes to comply with standards and totally obfuscate for the point. So one of the things they should be looking at is do the accounts communicate a true and fair view of the position of the company? Mm. I was going to try and sum up what's been talked about in the last hour, but I think I'm going to give up because no. there's just too many <laughs> elements and issues. Um, I'm aware that I'm keeping everyone from their dinner now, so we'll draw this to a close. Please ask these guys more questions afterwards. I'd just like to say thank you for listening so attentively, and thank you, panellists, for being the most interesting panel on accounting I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Thank <laughs> you.